Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit iBethel.org. Grab your Bibles and uh, it'll take me a little while to get there. So uh, open to Isaiah 61. It's, it's uh, kind of a hallmark passage for us and actually probably for the church in the last 2,000 years. <clears throat> we'll get to it in a little bit. Put a piece of paper in there or something. Unless you get bored with what I'm saying, then you can just read it while I'm talking. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus modeled what it looks like to be full of the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is actually a command in Scripture. It's a, it's both an invitation and a command. <laughs> it's kind of like being invited to a birthday party. And somebody says, you will be at my birthday party. That's, that's kind of the way this command came. It says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't live under the influence of this. Live under the influence of this. Don't let this shape how you walk. Let this shape how you walk. So Jesus modeled what it looked like to be full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, imagine this. Um, thankfully, we just got finished with a drought. We got tired of it and got rid of it last year. And, uh, and it wasn't near as fun as they said it would be. So we, we got rid of it, prayed it out of here. And we enjoyed bountiful rain last year. I've been here during three, or excuse me, two droughts, one back in the 70s and then one that just finished last year. Both times, the drought was so severe, they said it would take like 10 years for our lake to recover. And both times the Lord restored the lake in one year, one season. Uh, a, real, a real miracle I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for. But let's just imagine, for example, that you live in, uh, let's just say San Diego. I don't know what the rainfall is, but let's just say they get 10 in inches of rain a year. And, and you move to Redding during a drought and we get 20 inches and you move into this environment where there's 20 inches of rain. Droughts don't mean it doesn't rain. It just means it doesn't rain enough. But if you move from an area that has 10 inches and you move to an area where there's 20, you might think it's more than enough. See, a lot of people experience outpourings of the Spirit and they think it's abundant, but according to biblical standards, it's a drought. Jesus models what the fullness of the Holy Spirit looks like. And never to shame us, never to ridicule, look what I have, what you don't have. Never. It's always the invitation to pursue. It's always, it's always the invitation to, to go after what he has made available. It's interesting to me in Scripture that some things he has just determined will be given to you. And, and sometimes that's what happens. Sometimes there's just, you know, you're just in the room and you, you catch something. Other times, you know, he, he's, he's unpredictable because he's a God to join in relationship. He's not just philosophy. He's not just a God of, of principles where you take one, two, and three steps and you end up with an equation, point four or something. It's, it, he's not that way. It's a relational journey. And in this journey, he's invited us to do things. And some things just happen simply because you're in the room. Some, sometimes it's a simple prayer. I've I've watched some of the most extraordinary things happen to people who, who weren't even asking for it. God just literally just visited them. We've had people join us here. Some, some come very hungry. Others come, to be honest with you, they've told me just to check it off the list. You know, they had somebody say, you need to go. And, and, and they come just to kind of get their friend to leave them alone for a while, you know. And, and I, I get that. I've, I've done the same thing. <laughs> you know, you, you just... They won't get off my back till I do what they ask, so I just do them a favor. And some people literally have just come into the room that way, and then Jesus completely, totally heals them of something that's impossible. I remember a pastor friend sitting right over here that uh, almost didn't become a pastor because his dyslexia was so bad he just couldn't couldn't read, and uh, is it, it would turn things around so bad he'd have to study the Bible on on uh, like CDs and stuff. And uh, it was just so challenging. And he sat here and the Spirit of God fell upon him in fire. And, and he's, while it's happening, he, re, he discovers his bad attitude. <laughs> he goes face to face with the fact, I don't even want to be here and you're touching me anyway. 
And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. He said, God in his grace is just touching me. And he says, oh God, please don't let me mess this up because he could tell something was happening. And he went from someone who can't read to someone who then within <clears throat> just days is reading like six and eight hours a day. He just can't get enough because he suddenly, suddenly has no problem whatsoever with his, uh, with his eyes. He was sitting right over here. It's just the Lord just healed him. And, and so there are things like that that he just does the surprise thing. And there are other things that just come to us in seed form or come to us as promises, and he waits for us to pursue. He waits for us to come hungry. And there's so much of, of, uh, so much of the kingdom is actually available for those who pursue. And we pursue according to his invitation. We pursue according to his command. So anyway, we have this concept of, of Jesus uh, m- modeling fullness of the Holy Spirit. Another term that, that I use often, we use often, is Jesus Christ is perfect theology. There's, I don't believe there's a problem with a phrase, with a statement, but what's highly possible is theology is, is typically thought about that which we know about God. And Jesus was perfect theology in that he modeled perfect knowledge of God the burning conviction of what to do and the actions that followed that illustrated what he believed. There, was, there wasn't a separation between idea and display. There was no separation between the philosophy of healing, the burden to heal, and seeing people healed. They were, they were seamless in, in the way they merged. And Jesus is perfect theology in that sense, that he, he, he not only had the perfect insight and knowledge of the Father, because he is the eternal Son of God, he is exactly like the Father. I love Hebrews 1. It's maybe sometime we'll, we'll take some time just to, to study, because I, I really love the, I, I love Hebrews 1, how it says that Jesus is the exact representation of his nature. He is that which emanates from the Father in the same way that light comes from these light bulbs. So Jesus comes forth from the Father. So he is exactly like the Father. He represents him perfectly. There's zero blemish. There's zero difference between the Father and him in nature, in kind, in action, in word. Everything's exactly the same. So when Jesus uh, said, it's better that I go, and he would send the Holy Spirit, he used a, a term to describe the Holy Spirit as the word another. He says, I, I will send you another comforter. And there's a couple words that could have been used. There's a word that, that for example, uh, behind the piano here is a chair. And then you're sitting in a chair. They're not the same kind of chair, but they're both chairs. Would you agree? So here's a chair that you're sitting, and then there is another, but they're not the same. Whereas in the chairs you're sitting in, what Tom is sitting in is exactly the same as what Paul is sitting in. There's another And so when Jesus describes sending the Holy Spirit, he uses a a word that means exactly the same as me. So here's Jesus. He emanates from the Father. He's exactly like the Father. And then he says, I'm going to go. And the Holy Spirit who is with you is going to be in you. It's better that I go. And he is another comforter. He is exactly the same as me. So now if you can imagine this perfect representation of the Father now dwelling inside every born-again believer. And his longing is that accurate expression of who God the Father is would flow in and through us. So he models the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He models perfect theology. He, He contains, illustrates, demonstrates the knowledge of God and brings about the deliverance, the healing, etc., Jesus, every situation he entered into, he had a redemptive solution for. In in other words, there wasn't like a problem that he walked into and he looked at it and and, and walked out. He goes, I got to avoid this one. There wasn't any of those. He, he, um, he, He calmed storms. He slept in a storm. He would walk through a storm. He just, he was stormless. It was unaffected by storms. He affected storms. He, he, he was carrying something that affected storms. So every, every situation he entered into, he brought a redemptive touch into that situation. So the dead child he raised, the blind eyes he opened, the storm he would calm, or he would direct his disciples. So the point was, is he didn't avoid problems. He always walked into them with redemptive solutions. 
We know the, the Bible says that the devil uh, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's not an assignment by God. It's just what he does. The devil is not the opposite of God. He's the opposite of Michael. The devil is a created being who has zero, zero authority. Don't want to talk about him, but you get the point. So the devil comes to kill, steal, destroy, which means death, loss, and destruction are the fingerprints of his work. It's the residue of him being present in a situation. You find death, you know, you find something that's dying, you find something that's broken, then you know where the enemy's been. That's his, that's the, what, what he leaves behind. But Jesus comes in every situation with redemptive solutions and answers. In 1 John 3, 8, it says that he came to destroy the works of the evil one. Elsewhere, it says that he came to openly display the foolishness of darkness. And all of that is, is in measured way what the fullness of the Holy Spirit looks like. When, when the Lord says, be filled with the Spirit, it is literally enabling us to do exactly what Jesus did, illustrate the Father and deal with the affirmities, afflictions, the issues of life. There's not one that Jesus bypassed. I remember a, a passage that really messes with me a bit is out of Mark 9. And because it's very personal to me, there's a, there's a moment where a dad who's got a demonized child, he, he brings this child to the disciples to set him free. And they, they were so well experienced in the area of healing and deliverance that Jesus actually trusted them to go on their own in pairs to their hometowns. And they were, they were so successful in their ministry in their hometowns that when they regrouped with Jesus, they started arguing as to who was the greatest. They only argued as to who was the greatest because they just had such a great week. You know, they just saw demons leave and they saw miracles happen. And they thought, well... Peter's thinking there's no way John could have carried that kind of anointing. I'm pretty sure I have the corner on what Jesus just did. And, and so they got back and they were arguing. And Jesus doesn't mind making you successful to the point ugly things come to the surface. He's not afraid of the ugly things. In fact, he wants them to come to the surface so we can deal with them. It's when we put religious names on them, we actually, we actually pretend we're broken. We give it a virtuous name and it now has permission to stay and to grow. So when you take things that are really marks of brokenness and you put a virtuous name on it, then it now has permission to stay and set up camp. Anyway, back to the story. So Jesus brings the disciples into places of great success and they taste of heal, uh, miracles of healing and deliverance and all this stuff. And no doubt the, the crowd that the disciples are in have uh, they've been doing that because that's what they're assigned to do. Jesus told them to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, etc. So the, the dad sees this going on with the disciples. And he grabs his son because now there's hope and he brings the son to the disciples and they try everything they've tried. They rebuke every way they've rebuked before. They've bound, they've loosed, they've done everything they know to do. They probably poured oil, blew the shofar, played the tambourine, every Christian toy that they had available to them. <laughs> I'm sure they used just to get rid of that demon, but nothing happened. I, I had a similar situation. I'll never forget it. I happened to be in Southern California. I was, I was in, uh, I was in uh, some meetings there that, were, quite honestly, were extraordinary. It was just one of those times where Jesus just seemed to enter the room and there was so much stuff going on. And I don't remember one situation besides the little boy that was brought to me. A young mom brought her son to me, probably five or six years old, and he was just horribly, horribly demonized. I've seen Jesus set people free. It's a great privilege to bring liberty and freedom from that torment, from that evil, evil one. I did everything I knew to do that I had done before. I prayed, I bound, I, you know, I, I just tried to do exactly what the father was doing, and, and that child didn't get free. And the mother looked at me after I spent fair amount of time with them both. And she said, what do I do now? Because the child wasn't free. I'll never forget it. I'll never, I'll never forget the look in her face. She wasn't rude. She wasn't, she didn't point the finger at me. And, but, 
But it seemed to me that when she said, what do I do now? She was really saying, is that all you got? You know, and, and, and it was, it was you, you, you're stuck realizing you've done your best and that child that you are so moved for, moved for is leaving in the same condition they came in with. This is the same with the wheelchairs that come in week after week. It's the same with the various conditions. I am thrilled with what we see happen. I, I've seen things I didn't know I'd ever get a chance to see. We had more stuff happen this week, just unusual invasions of God, absolute raw miracles. And I'm thankful. I'm not ungrateful at all. I, he's already gone way beyond anything I'd see in my lifetime. But he's, he's touched me deep enough to ruin me, to stay there. And this father brought this child to, to Jesus, uh, or to the disciples. They couldn't, they couldn't get him free. And, and so um, he saw Jesus, and he took the child to Jesus, and Jesus uh, drove the evil spirits out, and, and the child was free. The disciples watched this, and they were stunned by his success. They were stunned by him being able to do what they couldn't do because they were trained by him. They, they weren't uh, careless uh, rookies. I mean, they actually knew what they were doing, and, and they couldn't get free. And so they saw Jesus bring deliverance to the child, and it says they took Jesus aside, and they asked him, how come we couldn't get the, the child free? And there's that great, very famous statement that Jesus made. He said, well, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. And to come out of that story with that as a formula, and I mean that in a good sense, as a, a principle to follow when you don't get breakthrough, pray and fast is really, really huge. It's, it's something all of us can glean from that story. But I think there's a bigger lesson from that story. When there's not a breakthrough, you take Jesus aside. Because sometimes the breakthrough comes with prayer and fasting, but sometimes it's a decree. Sometimes it's a radical act of obedience. Sometimes it's, it's a, a giving. Sometimes it's, it's the shout of praise. I mean, it's, it's just any number of things that he brings us into. I've watched all these. We learn them as principles, but we don't turn them on and turn them off at will to get what we want. We are, we are children that learn to respond to a father and do as he's leading us to do. And that's our life's journey. That's our life's goal is to say what the father's saying. Do what we see the father doing. We've been invited into that kind of a relationship where we actually get to represent the Father. It was the command of Jesus in John 20 when he, after he had raised from the dead, the disciples were hiding in a room. They're scared to death. Jesus walks through the wall, which really helped them with their fear issues. <laughs> I'm sure pampers were needed by everyone. And he gives them, there's this encounter that, that extends for several verses, but the, but the, uh, the conclusion or at the, at the conclusion of this encounter, Jesus says, as the Father sent me, I send you. If you look at every verse that describes Jesus' coming as sent from the Father, the overwhelming theme is he was sent by the Father to reveal the Father. And so if we take that as Jesus' primary function, to reveal the Father. And then Jesus turns to those who follow him and he says, as the Father sent me, I send you. Then really what he's saying is, your privilege in life is to reveal the Father. But I'd like to suggest to you, it's impossible to do adequately without being filled with the Spirit. I'm not trying to make this a doctrinal issue. There are many who, I, I, I think praying in tongues is glorious. I can't imagine life without it. I like what Paul said. I pray in tongues more than all of you. The language he uses there, he says, I pray more in tongues than all of you combined. In other words, I'm a tongue talker. And that's, that's, you know, I, I believe in, I believe in that breakthrough. I know what it's like to be edified by just praying in the spirit and have the Holy Spirit pray through. I, I love, but it, it would be like, it, it would be like, if that's the goal, it, it's a worthy goal, but if that's the Jeez, I about died right there. I almost, I almost, almost did crowd surfing right there. That's, that would have been fun to see if you caught, yeah, with no crowd down here, that would have plopped. Yeah. yeah. I'll be careful around that little hinge again. All right. I don't know what I was saying, but it was really good. Help me out, somebody. Tongues. 
It would be like going through the, the River Jordan into the Promised Land, and you cross the river, and you've got houses built, you've got lands, vineyards planted, you've got all this stuff to inherit. You walk through this river on dry ground, you stand on the banks of the river, and you stand there for your entire life and never enter the purpose for going through the river. Yes, tongues are valuable. Yes, that shoreline is important, but it's the beginning of a breakthrough in which the, the Lord Almighty, the God of the universe, is represented and manifest through people that taste of his goodness and his provision. Isaiah chapter 61. I, I fear that sometimes I become too familiar with the passage. Sometimes I'll read it in a different translation. Sometimes I'll, I'll read it out loud. Sometimes I'll stop after each phrase and think. I, I need to jar myself from familiarity because some things are so huge. Some things are so weighty that it's easy to skim over the surface of something and not be impacted by its depth. And this is one of those passages. This is what Jesus read in his hometown of Nazareth. I think we studied it a week or two ago, a, a little bit. Um, this is what he read to announce the beginning of his ministry from Nazareth. And so it's in verse one, he says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Such a, such a wonderful, wonderful verse. And really what he's saying is, he's saying, listen, the Holy Spirit is upon me. I know the Holy Spirit lives in us. As, as, we, as I've stated countless times through the years, the Holy Spirit is in me for my sake, but he rests upon me for yours. And we have to understand that when the Spirit of God comes upon us, it's always for action. It's always for impact. It's always to change something. We've been privilege to step into the middle of an impossibility. We may not know what's supposed to happen. We just know God doesn't want it left the way it is. And we come in looking to him. Our hearts turn to him for solutions. We don't, we don't come as the smart people. We don't come with the people that always have the plan. Sometimes we know the least about a given situation, but we step into the middle of an impossibility knowing that the God of the universe, the creator of all, lives in us and he has practical solutions for the situation. And here we have this announcement that Jesus makes over his own life. And he basically is describing the broken, the poor, the blind, the lame, the, you know, the imprisoned, the tormented, the, all this stuff. He says, I'm here to fix that. But then he comes to this, the end of verse three, talks about these people that are broken becoming oaks of righteousness. I, I remember uh, we used to, oh, we, we'd go uh, get firewood in Weaverville. And, uh, and it, it, was, it was a love-hate relationship. It was fun to be outdoors, but man, it was work. And we'd, we'd go in, in, in areas, you know, where they had uh, trees had fallen down because of the wind, uh, windfall. And we'd get in there and chop them, or cut them up and get the rounds, put them into the truck. And, and it was always this uh, very, very interesting journey. But we would get on these logging roads and sometimes we'd have a friend that'd have a key to a gate and we'd get on these logging roads and, and maybe the area hasn't been logged for, you know, like 20 years, 30 years. And there's these little pine trees about this big around that grow up in the, in the middle of, right in the middle of the road. Well, into your truck, you just go right over them. It doesn't, it doesn't kill them. They just bend over and then they bounce back up after you go past them. You run into an oak tree that size, you got an issue because that thing isn't budging and you now have damaged your car. And so we learned, oh, oh, oak tree, oak tree, go around the oak tree, you know. But we'd see the pines, they just bounce down, bounce back up. Oaks of righteousness are absolutely stable and that's the goal of the Lord for the most broken of the world, oaks of righteousness. He's saying, I will take the most broken among you. But remember, he doesn't choose us because we're qualified. He doesn't choose us because we're gifted. If we have anything, it's only because he gave it to us. 
It's, it's, it's not about that at all. He chooses the least for a reason. In this passage, he champions the most broken. Why? Because that's where he receives the most glory. And so here are the most broken of the world. Jesus steps into their life. Are you the anointed one? You, the one who carries the fullness of power of the Holy Spirit in your life, step into that person's life to see that that individual restored. They're now set free. They sleep at night. They're not tormented anymore. Those that were so bound with fear and anxiety are now free to think creatively. They have have an impact in their job. They have an impact as an entrepreneur. They influence other people's values. They don't do the addiction, the drug thing anymore. They're now reaching out to their friends that are bound by those addictions. And what happens is the person that were once the most broken of the community community become the oaks of righteousness, that which has such firm roots that you just can't budge them, you can't move them. Well, there's a reason for that. There's a purpose. There's, a, there's an unto something in that great miracle. It's verse four. They shall rebuild old ruins. They shall raise up former desolations. Say, they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. This is, a, this is one of the most beautiful pictures in the Bible. You've got the most broken become the most stable, but they don't stop with their own personal stability. They don't stop by saying, I can now prosper. They're saying, all right, let's rebuild the city. Let's rebuild the city. Here's the point that I want to share out of, out of this. You don't get the rebuilders if you don't get broken people healed. If you don't get broken people healed, you don't get rebuilt cities. We keep crying out for our city to be healed and restored and, you know, all the stuff that's in our heart. This only happens when you have people here that are filled with the Spirit. There's a cause and effect. There's people that carry this fullness of the Spirit that live under the influence of this outpouring, this constantly changing, ebb and flow, and constantly moving from this to that because it's relational. It's not, it's not we memorize six principles and then change the world. It's a relational, it's a relational thing. We had an interesting experience this last uh, week. I, I met with some leaders on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning. And uh, Tuesday was the 500-year anniversary of, of, the, of the Reformation. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. And I, I, I didn't realize when I called these leaders together, I didn't realize that uh, we would actually be meeting on the actual day of the 500-year Reformation. I mean, we've been celebrating it all year, praying into it, talking about it. But I didn't realize I'd be with these friends of mine on the day. And uh, they, uh, my team put name tags for everyone because they come from... Uh, nations around the world. It's about 40 of them. So we met up at the summit up by the lake and, and we're in this uh, lodge area for a couple of days. And uh, on the name tags, at the top of the name tag is, is, a, is a skeleton key. And uh, that was above the name tag. Well, on, uh, it's a beautiful sunny day and we're outside during breaks. We all stand outside. It's so beautiful. You can see Shasta Dam and the lake and down into the valley. It's just, it's just gorgeous. And, you know, they're all out there taking pictures because the view is so pretty. And come back in, one of the guys is looking through his pictures and he looks and he goes, man, he says, look at this. And there are clouds in the shape of a skeleton key. <laughs> Do you guys have that? I was told you guys actually had that. I, I should have warned you, you don't have it. Okay. Maybe someday I'll show you. Until then, you have to imagine I have people take pictures of clouds and they say, do you see him? I go, who am I supposed to see? <laughs> they go, it's Jesus. Oh, is that it? Look at the top. Now, if, if I could show, look at that. You do have it. Presto. All I have to do is dream and it happens. It just, <laughs> can you see the top, the circle? That's exactly how the key looks on the name tag. Do you guys have a picture of that? As long as I'm asking. How about Ferraris? Do you have any Ferraris back there? I really like Ferraris. No, no Ferraris. Okay, all right. So here's the, here's the point. Here, here we've got this unusual thing. There it is. Skeleton key. It looks exactly like the one in the name tag. So we come inside. We're kind of chuckling about it. We're, we're thinking, this is so fascinating. One of the guys turns around, and in a vase, is a beautifully decor- decorated lodge. In a vase, the guy turns around, And he looks in a vase, and inside the vase is this skeleton key. So we've got these clouds in the sky, we've got the name tag, we've got the skeleton key. It came with a house, I don't know why it's there, but it it was hiding in this vase. He pulls that out, and someone had a prophetic word. 500 years ago, 
They nailed the 95 Thesis to the door, but the Lord is now giving you a key to go through the door in this next reformation. It's amazing. I have have people give me pictures of clouds and go, do you see them? I go, man, I'm trying. I'm I'm trying. In fact, my staff makes fun of me. They hang up hung up one in my office just so that I can look at it. It doesn't look like Jesus to me, but that's all. Anyway. So here's, here's the point. Is we've got verse 4. We've got this beautiful, beautiful declaration of God. Can I put it this way? Verse 4, rebuilding cities. That was the target God began with when he began to fill people with the Spirit. It was the target. He was saying, all right, right, so you've never dealt with addiction, but guess what? I'm going to put the Spirit of God upon you in such a profound way. I'm going to have you talk with somebody who's bound by addiction. You're going to bring freedom. That fullness of the Spirit on you is to bring freedom to them. And that person that becomes free, they are going to become stable. And as they become stable, they will become the rebuilders of broken cities. But it all starts with somebody saying, Holy Spirit, come, baptize me anew, baptize me afresh, fill me with your spirit. Many people stop short of a divine encounter because they're satisfied with good theology. They're happy with meeting whatever qualifications they may have for being filled with the spirit. Well, I pray in tongues, well, I do this, I do that. Listen, the point is, is there power coming forth from your life that sets captives free? That's the issue. It's the the issue. The Holy Spirit's in you to comfort you, to bring peace to you, to give you insight, all that stuff. That's for you. But this Spirit of God who comes upon us, that is for us to bring about transformation in the events and and stuff around us. That's the purpose. It's measurable. The fullness of the Spirit is measured by impact. In Acts chapter 2, we know that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an extraordinary chapter. It's a Pentecostal's favorite chapter. It's where there's this outpouring of the Spirit. It's extraordinary. But in chapter 4, it happens again. And it's anywhere from, some would say, two to maybe as many as five years after the day of Pentecost. And so we've got some of the same people that are in Acts 2 that are rocked, where thousands are added daily. They're in the same experience a couple years later. What's the point? As you're a broken vessel, you leak. Old timers used to put it this way. They say, stay under the spout where the glory comes out. You know, that's, that's, how, that's the whole deal. It's just you just stay under in that place where the Spirit of God comes upon you continuously. My testimony yesterday is wonderful, but it is no excuse for the absence of hunger today. Anytime yesterday's experience erases my hunger for today, I've I've chosen where to level off. When in fact the Lord has invited us into this relationship, we're being filled with the Holy Spirit, ongoing filling of the Holy Spirit actually becomes necessary for us to demonstrate who the Father is. I don't think it's possible In fact, I'm confident it's not possible to adequately display the love of God without power. I I love the practical stuff. I mean, I do. I I, I love, and I do mean I really love. I love giving the sandwich to somebody that's hungry and giving the coat and the shoes and the stuff that the people need. We love to do this. I love this. But without power, they're still bound. Their belly may be full, which is important. But the addiction that's, that got them to that place of brokenness has got to be broken. Somebody's got to come in filled with the Spirit of God that breaks that thing off, that knows how to end this cycle. Of maybe it's five generations of poverty. Just break it off. God has given the ability to make wealth to every individual. Anyone who will just turn their hearts to him and say yes. He gives the ability and then he reveals the purpose for wealth, for prosperity, for blessing. It's unto something. It's never about accumulation. This, this kingdom that we live in is so different 
so different to you. you, you you're exalted by going low. You become filled by becoming empty. You, it's, just, it's just a different kingdom. It's just a different kingdom. And he welcomes us into this kingdom where there's conflict and understanding that enables us to understand. It's the a, it's a, it's a strangest thing where you realize abundance is measured by what you've given away, not by what you have. <coughs> Fullness. Give me those two water bottles down there. Thanks, Eric. So we've got two water, one water bottle that's full, the one that's almost full. This is legal to sell because it's full. This one has been tampered with. This is legal to sell. It's full, but it's not really full. In fact, it's not full until it overflows. It's overflow. That's, that's what reveals its fullness. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is never measured by what you have. It's measured by what overflows you. It's, what, it's measured what overflows. See, this kingdom is a different kingdom. It it's completely functions differently. It's not by what I contain. It's not by what I keep. It's what I release. It's what I give away. I almost threw this without the top on. That would be... <laughs> just, yeah, throw, throw it on Chris. Just throw it over on Chris, yeah. <laughs> I love the privilege of coming together anytime we have the chance. I, I do love Sunday mornings. They're, they're, they're full, uh, the multiple gatherings, but I, I, do, I do love the chance to get together. My only regret is that Sunday night is the service without end. So when we come to this point in the meeting, we just say, all right, everybody come to the front. We start laying hands on people and just going for it. Sunday morning, if I do that to you, we have a whole other group coming up the hill in just a few minutes. And so I'm just going to say, if you, if you have the nerve, come back. Come back, come back to the gathering without end. That's not a threat. I do want to pray for you now. I want you to go and stand. I do want to pray that the Spirit of God would come so powerfully upon you that He would so deeply expand our ability to represent Him, to carry presence. Is Paul speaking tonight? Is that, is that a rumor? Paul? Paul and Sue are in the house. Isn't that wonderful? Back from, from the UK for a short time, so we're going to turn Paul loose tonight. I, th- I also want to have a testimony or two from Robbie Dawkins, so we'll see how that works. He, my goodness, he just rocked my world this week with some stories. Oh, Jesus. You know, when, how many of you are parents? How many of you remember when you would have a, a little child that just wasn't hungry and it was always a sign of something not right, fever, something's not right. You remember that? The absence of hunger actually revealed something that wasn't right. Sometimes the beginning place for me through the years has been just the, uh, the invitation, the willingness to become hungry. If shame and guilt could get us there, we'd all, all, all of us would already be there. We know he never shames us. He's such a perfect father. He never shames us. But he's also not afraid of making me uncomfortable. He's also not afraid of offending the way I think to show me how he thinks. So I want you just to begin to pray. I want you to ask the Lord to completely fill you with his, his spirit. Just put it on your lips. I want you just to pray. Ask him to release the presence, the power of God upon you in ways that are new. Just lift your voices and pray.
Yes, Lord, we are hungry. We're so hungry for you to do of above and beyond all we could ask or think of. We don't even know what we're asking for. We just know it's available and we know it's good. So we just ask for more. Father God, let this be the beginning season of a fullness of the Spirit that we've never yet known about. Let it be that which enables us to not just nail something to the door, but actually go through the door at the beginning of this next Reformation. Let it happen through people that are actually filled to fullness, overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is now being translated in several languages. Visit podcasts.ibethel.org. Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit Bethel.com. Why don't uh, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. <clears throat> we're, get, we're actually going to read from two places in the Scripture. We're going to read from Matthew 1, a little a verse I think maybe out of chapter 2, we'll see. And then also 2 Corinthians 5. So we're going we're gonna to use these two passages. Let's read this uh, first one here in Matthew, and then, uh, and then I want to talk to you for a bit before we, we jump into uh, 2 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> We're going to start in verse 20. While he thought about it, this is Joseph, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, you will call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. Jump to verse 23. Behold, this is what a prophet said, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You should call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Christmas is, uh, is the, the season that emphasizes the absolute greatest story ever told. And it's the, the coming of Christ. And there's a, a lot of people who have this notion that Jesus came to earth to plead on our behalf, to calm down an angry father that was looking for somebody to punish and I, I don't know that that's something you would believe because we've, we've gone through this enough through the years. But Jesus actually came to do the opposite. He came to reveal a father that was passionate for his people. But here's the context in which he came and the context in which we, we live today. There's secularization of culture is working very hard to remove the concept of a creator. And when you get rid of a creator, let me rename it. When you get rid of the designer, you get rid of design. Because you can't have design without a designer. And the effort is to erase the lines of uniqueness to all that God has made and the purposes that he has created us for. So if you don't have a designer, then you don't have design and you're free to do what you want. Design implies that when God created us with design, he created us with purpose. Purpose carries with it the implication of destiny, and destiny carries with it the responsibility of accountability. So the bottom line is the effort to destroy the concept of a creator, a designer, is to erase that which we were born with. It's the conviction that I'll have to give an account of my life. When Jesus, when God created the world, it says in Genesis 1, 10 times it says, he created these animals to reproduce after their kind, is the phrase, 10 times, after their kind. So there's two laws in creation that are actually uh, 
reveal part of why Jesus, it was necessary for Jesus to come. Number one, we reproduce after our kind. Um, you, you plant a flower seed, you don't grow a horse. You know, it reproduces after its kind. Within each species, there's latitude, but there's no crossing over. If you take a donkey, a male donkey, a female horse, I think it is, I think I have it right. They breed, you get a mule, but that mule cannot reproduce because it is outside of design. It's gotta get deep into us that by nature, we were created to reproduce. And I don't just mean, obviously, children who have children who have children. I mean just in life, that we are contributors to society. That's who we are. In the story of the Minas, there's this parable where uh, 10 servants were given a sum of money. They, in turn, reinvested it, and the master came back to collect the profits. And the one who, who increased his one talent to 10, that master said, now be in charge of 10 cities Enter into the joy of your master. Here's what you need to see. Responsibility was their access to greater joy. Greater responsibility, because joy is not something you get by doing nothing. It's something you get by functioning according to design. Design is what connects us to purpose. Design is what, there are different gifts and in individuals in this room, unique giftings. You have something to contribute to the overall story of mankind that no one else can, can contribute. There's a uniqueness over every person. We were made in the image of God. And so when you destroy the concept of design and purpose, you've erased this sense of accountability for illustrating who he is. And every person, let me back up. The sin issue entered the picture. Sin is operating outside of design. What is the design? It's in the image of God. It's anything outside of the nature and character of Christ is what is sin. So when Jesus came, he came because of this reproducing out of kind. So you have horses, give birth to horses, people to people, flowers to flowers. But sinners, reproduce sinners. That, that cycle had to be stopped. We'll get to it in a minute. Another thing that he created in all of creation was he, he called it in uh, um, Genesis 8, I think it is, he calls it seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. That means you reap what you sow. You plant a seed and it will bring forth fruit. If I if I sow a um, 1,000 acres of corn, I'm going to have a harvest from that corn. If I sow mercy, blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. It's, it's just written in all of, all of creation that what you plant, you will harvest. And so Jesus saying that humanity has been planting actions apart from God not for his glory, independent of purpose and design, stepped into the scene to stop the flow of sowing and reaping. We'll look at it in a moment. He actually took upon himself all the fruitfulness of wrongdoing that, that, was, that we earned. He took upon himself what I deserved so that I could receive what he deserved. That's what salvation is. It's not just a temporary postponement of sin. It's actually, he took upon himself the punishment I deserved. And he did it so that I could receive the life he deserved. That's Christmas. I saw a picture this week I, I really liked. It was, it was a, a Christmas wreath and a crown of thorns. And somebody put the two together. So it was a half wreath and half thorn. And it said, the season the reason. It was a costly introduction to a season where everything is about a father restoring people to design, restoring to purpose. I, I cringe. Uh, the, the internet, I love and I hate. Love-hate relationship. I cringe at times when I hear what some people confess Christ will say about another movement, 
a political party, a racial group, a, ethnic, a, 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 a social economic group, whatever, comments that are made that are just frightening to me. And what concerns me is I know they will have to harvest those seeds. Is this not only damaging, but it comes around. I, I've watched people who are just seem to be naturally uh, contentious. They have a lot of contention in their life. And sometimes I just want to tell them, stop planting the seeds. This will change in your life. You just stop planting the seeds. So Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What we are harvesting today are the seeds we planted yesterday. Jesus came and interrupted the cycle so that the irreversible damage could be stopped and a new creation would take place. Take a look at me, uh, with me at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> In verse 15, it says, He died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Look at verse 17 again. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have been passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The last thing that we needed as people is some kind of a soothing ointment over the open wound of sin. We didn't need a spiritual band-aid over a problem. He actually needed to come and to change everything to where there was a new start, a new beginning. In Genesis 1, we read of the creation of all things on the seventh day he rested. Since that time, there has never been anything new created until Jesus died and was raised from the dead. Then everyone who puts their faith in him is what the Bible calls born again. And in that born again experience, they become something that has never existed before, a new creation. I had a, a couple plants in Weaverville that, uh, in my office that I had for years. One of them I had, I had in Reading before I moved to Weaverville. And, and I actually ended up with this plant for like seven, uh, maybe 19 or 20 years. So we had a good, good friendship, me and that plant. And I only watered it with coffee. If I had leftover coffee, that's what it got. If I had none, it didn't get anything. If I wasn't in there for a few days, it just didn't get anything unless maybe my secretary watered it. So I had this one plant that was in this pot like this, this big, and it, it was in this pot for um, oh, probably 17 years. And 16 years anyway. And right before, a few months before we moved, I decided to transplant it. So I, I took it out. And when I brought it out of the pot, French roast coffee is what it smelled like. It smelled, it smelled, like, it smelled like this. This plant is a reproducer of coffee. I mean, it had just been saturating coffee for 17 years. So, so I, I put it into a, a bigger pot. And uh, something happened. I put it in this bigger pot. And within a very short time, it started to blossom and have flowers. I never saw that before in my life. I, I, I put it in a new setting. It expanded to its new environment and produced things it never produced before. Never once did it ever produce flowers, but it did in this new pot. Jesus, when he caused you to be born again, you were put into his shoes that are significantly larger than ours. But every day of our life, he works to, give, to enable us to grow into the fullness of what he designed us to be. And in that context, we bring a fruitfulness to the planet through our life that is impossible without the grace of God, impossible without that natural gift that God would give us so that Jesus could be seen once again. <clears throat> this verse, old things have passed away, all things have become new, has become a champion verse for probably most all of us. Let's read a few more, and then uh, I'll, I'll talk, and we're going to uh, pray over a few things together. <clears throat> Verse 18, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Say this with me. God has given me, has given me the ministry of reconciliation. 
Now let's say it again, together. God has given me the ministry of reconciliation. That's actually true for everybody in this room. It's a mandate, it's a call, it's kind produces kind. Once you're reconciled to God, your nature is to be a reconciler. Kind reproduces kind. Kind reproduces kind. All right, right, right. you you had a chance, you missed it. All right. Jump down to verse 20. It says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, last verse. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Verse 21 again. He made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Here's the, here's the deal. Uh, my favorite definition of mercy and grace is mercy is when I don't get what I deserve and grace is when I get what I don't deserve. Mercy is where I don't get what I deserve. Grace is when I get what I don't deserve. Jesus came, lived perfect, faced every kind of temptation a person can face. He did not yield to any of them in the slightest measure. He became what would be called a lamb that had no blemish, was not defiled, there was nothing wrong with it. He became the perfect offering, why? Because this cycle of sowing and reaping was going to destroy for eternity all of humanity. And Jesus stepped into the middle of that and basically said, put the harvest that they deserve on me. I'll take all of it. And it was in the past and every person in the future, he took upon himself the punishment that every person deserved. It's not an angry father that's looking to destroy people. It's this creation that requires Productivity, increase, reproducing after its kind, sowing, reaping, it's the way you come into life. If he changes the laws, he changes the way we come into breakthrough and maturity and progress. So instead, Jesus came and bore the punishment for all that which was wrong. And then he turns to us and he says, you're reconciled to God, now you be a reconciler. I don't understand this verse. It says that Jesus became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. I like it. I just don't understand it, but I sure like it. How is it possible for you and me to be living examples of the righteousness of God? But that's what he says. Those are shoes that we're growing into. I believe that today is, marks a season of break- breakthrough. Um, about two or three weeks ago, uh, Eric led in a, in a prayer time here, and he's, he spoke about that in the last uh, several weeks of the year, I, th- I think it was a month, maybe five weeks, the last several weeks of the year, that we'd see more miracles in that period of time than we did in the previous 11 months. In other words, it'd be compounded, be increased. And we prayed into that. Then Chris got up, in that similar period of time. And he announced, um, I'm gonna use the word reconciliation, restoration, but he used different terms. But it was people who had family members who had not been walking with the Lord, that they would be restored in their, in their faith, in their relationship with God. And it was a great time of prayer. And uh, one of the greatest miracles in the Valentin household ever took place before the day had passed. He literally went home from here and got a phone call from one of his grandsons that was going left when God was going right and called the grandpa and said, I'm not, I'm not right with God and I wanna be in, 
And it's a long story, but it's a beautiful story. I feel like when God is breathing on something, that's what we give ourselves to. We stand in that and we say, we join our voice with his. His is the creative, powerful voice, but it's the partnership that brings release, specific application to his heart to broken situations. So we hear what God is saying. We say, this is the day of reconciliation. This is the day of reconciliation. This is the day of being restored to God. I think it was within the last two years, Billy Graham died. What a wonderful man. I, I, my name is, I, should, I hate to say this, but my name is actually Billy. Don't call me Billy, my name's Bill, but my name is Billy. It's not William. They'll ask me, if, you know, is your name actually William? No, no, it's Billy. You know, my mom's apologizing. My, my, uh, no, don't, 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 don't. It's an it's incredible honor. My mom met Billy Graham. My uncle worked for him and uh, was his right-hand man for a number of years. And my mom met him just uh, weeks before I was born. And I inherited that name, which is a great honor. Billy Graham, great man, a man of integrity, a man of great faith. And he just gave his life for people to know Jesus, to know the love of God. He did it all over the world. And then last week, we had the home going of Reinhard Bonnke, who is one of the greatest men I've ever met. Tonight, we have Heidi Baker uh, coming and it would be Heidi, uh, Reinhardt Bonnke, and Brother Yoon. Those are the three scariest people I know. And uh, <laughs> Reinhardt just went home to be with the Lord. Unusual evangelist. He just brought so many. 79 million people came to faith in Christ through his ministry through the years that they know about. When the Lord takes people home like this, their gifts remain. But I don't believe that what God is doing is going to raise up another Billy Graham or another Reinhard Bonnke. What he's doing is he's trying to bring all of us into that inheritance to walk in the grace, to walk in the anointing, to walk in that heart for people that these two great, great leaders had. And uh, so we're going to actually pray into that today. We're gonna do a couple things together because I feel like uh, whenever we've done this, I, I don't know how many times it's been, but you know, maybe 10, 15 times in 20 years, we'll take part of a meeting just to pray corporately over specific things. How many of you were here for the, the I want my knife back uh, meeting several years ago? It was, it was just the weirdest, uh, weirdest story and a series a sequence of events. It basically has to do with lost items, God miraculously restoring. And there's a long story to it. I don't wanna take the time for it now. But we saw the Lord honor corporate prayer for that area. And we had stories that continued. We had inheritances that were lost in, in uh, court cases that had been wrapped up for years that were released that week. So many things that were bound and lost that were restored. It was extraordinary. What was it? It was, it was doing what he said he, he was doing. It's breathing out what he's breathing. It's involving himself in what he's involving himself with. And I believe today, He's involving himself in these things. We're supposed to pray for economic breakthrough for those who have impossible economic situations. We're supposed to pray for relational healing for those who have impossible conflicts. In fact, as the cool thing is nothing is impossible with God. And the things that look to be the most impossible, tell them hello. <laughs> Jesus is calling. We, we actually, it's all right, it's, it's all right. It's, it's, we had somebody call years ago, our, our secretary was praying for somebody behind their desk that just needed a real deliverance, you know. And they were praying for him and the, church, the phone rang at the church, you know. So she went and grabbed the phone and instead of saying good morning Bethel Church, she said, I plead the, what, I, I plead the blood of Jesus or so, something like that. She wasn't thinking. She was still praying for this person in her mind when she answered for The person on the other end of, end of the phone fell under the power of God. So you never, you never know what you're going to get. So, so we're going to pray together for the economic breakthrough. We're going to pray for relational healing. I feel like there, there are, anytime you have a crowd this number, it's not even a word of knowledge. We always know there's relational difficulties and challenges. We're going to pray for healing there. We're going to pray for um, the health. Uh, there are impossible cases uh, medically 
uh, in this room that just need a miracle. And we're going to join together and pray for that in just a moment. Because this is, I, I saw colon cancer healed right here. Saw a woman get out of a wheelchair right over here, stroke 58 years, gets up and begins to walk. Seen uh, a whole series of about four different diseases right over there, just completely healed uh, that were impossible. MS, West Nile, no, West Nile virus is already healed. Several things, just all over this room, I can look around and just see right back over here, a woman's jaw that broke 10 years ago. She couldn't open her mouth without pain, was instantly healed. All through this room, uh, Olympic athletes right over here that were healed of career ending type injuries, Jesus heals them. So it just happens here. It happens here and it might as well be your day. And so in fact, we have so many watching uh, on Bethel TV, we bless you prophesy to you, get in on this because we want to pray for this kind of a breakthrough. But the greatest miracle of all is actually a person being reconciled to God. Reconciled to God. It's, it's, it's not hoops that we jump through. It's certainly not joining a, a church membership or something. It's not that. It's a personal relationship with Jesus. And Jesus comes and he's standing with the hand of the Father and he's reaching for yours. And he's saying, I want to bring these two back together. I want to restore you to design, to purpose. Because you have a purpose for your life that is rich, it's wonderful, it's significant. And that's what he does. He restores, reconciles to design and to purpose. If there's anyone here that would just say with me, I, I, I want to be reconciled to God. I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't know what it is to be the new creation, to actually be different on the inside by his doing, not mine. I don't want to leave this place until I know I have peace with God. If that's anybody here in that category, all I want you to do is put your hand up and we're just going to pray for you. Right back over here is one. Anybody else? Put your hand up. Right down here's another one. Put your hand up. Right over here's another one. Beautiful. Put your hand. It's time. Amen. It's just time. Another one back over here. Beautiful. Yeah, we give thanks for this. It's, th this is about to multiply, so get ready to disciple people. Get ready. Jesus didn't say, go make converts. He said, make disciples. And um, this is the great privilege. So all... Put your hand up again if you, put your, if you raised your hand a minute ago. Put your hand up again if, uh, if you raised it right here. Anyone sitting around them, just put your hand on their shoulder. Just pray for them right now. Pray for the greatest, most significant breakthrough of their life to come right now, to come right now, for the Spirit of God to come upon them. At the end, I'm gonna ask you guys to come to the front here to talk with our team. But right now, I want you to pray. Anybody who's watching on Bethel TV, they would just say, Bill, I don't wanna... I, I don't want to leave this broadcast until I know that I have found peace with God. You just prayed the same thing. God, restore me, reconcile me to God, reconcile me. I put my faith in Jesus in his work to restore me completely. So we declare over these people that there would be such a transformation, a transformation of life that happened from the inside out, inside out. Just declare, I believe in Jesus. Let's say it all together. I believe in Jesus as my Lord, my Savior. I, I sit here as a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Change me now from the inside out. I give you my past. I give you my present. I give you my future. All of my trust is in you. Thank you, Lord. Beautiful. Now, anybody who has a relational impossibility. Put a hand up, I wanna see who you are. Stand, if that's you. Any kind of a relational impossibility. It's just impossible with man, not, you know. For, for most of us in this room, uh, our problem uh, starts getting solved the moment we stop being impressed by the size of our problem. And uh, for most of us, we just need to shift our attention to a perfect loving father who is more than able to repair and to fix that situation. I want you to extend your hand towards these. Some of you stand, stand around them. Just pray for them. Once again, on Bethel TV, we declare the same thing, that God would work wonders in your household, in your family, and that family members that have been uh, out of sorts with other family members, we declare that Jesus bore the dividing wall on his flesh when he was crucified. He took away the power of division, and we declare the healing 
healing, the restoring of broken hearts. God, restore families, restore households, restore marriages, restore children to parents, parents to children. Yeah, church, I'm gonna hear you pray. Just take just a moment longer to pray over these and just bless them. Bless them, bless them. Thank you, Lord. Now, before the Christmas season is over, we ask for miracles in households, miracles in families, restore in the wonderful name of Jesus. And Lord, we do pray this, that you would be glorified. Amen, amen. Go ahead and sit down. Anyone who is uh, facing an impossible medical situation, I want you to stand. Without God, it's an impossible medical situation. Just stand up. <clears throat> impossible medical situation. Yeah, please stand. It's just, it's just a day of miracles. The things I've seen happen, oh goodness gracious, in this, in this room. You know, this colon cancer guy was a gang leader from another city who heard that God was healing people. And he came here and he got healed. And the report I got back was he went back as a gang leader evangelizing the gang members with this message of, of Jesus' love. And so we just declare that over every household here. Stand up around these, pray for them. Just declare that healing word. Find out where they need the miracle, pray. Just pray. Just pray. God, restore completely. We declare the same for our friends at home. The healing grace of Jesus would fill your household. The healing grace of Jesus would fill your household. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. <clears throat> we rebuke torment, affliction. In the name of Jesus, loose people's bodies. The Bible says he sent his word and healed them. So we declare the healing word over them now. In Jesus' name. Every cancer cell dies in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Lar larynx? Lar is there a part of the body called the larynx? Yeah. Larynx? Lar what is it? Lar larynx? Larynx? Uh, it's right here. Who has a problem with that? There's a. What is it called? Larynx? Larynx? Right, right back here? What is it? Larynx? Is that, did I say it right? Whatever it is, if you got the problem there, this is your day. Somebody put your hand on that and just pull off the affliction in Jesus' name. I had a staff member buy me an anatomy book once. It's a coloring book because I have issues. So we declare the healing word of Jesus over your body now. Jesus, mighty name. Yeah, fully restore what was stolen here. Okay, go ahead and be seated. All right, one more. Uh, no, two more things. Economic, financial impossibility. That's you, Stan. Some of you just keep standing for everything. I think you, you're just a glutton for more prayer. By the way, Heidi's gonna be here tonight. You know, I don't know how many... I know this is hard for some to believe, but I, I've been there. I've, I've seen, they've, they've had hundreds of resurrections from the dead. And here's the deal. They don't even count it a resurrection unless they've been dead at least four hours. So if they've not been breathing for three and they're cold and stiff and they're raised up, that's a healing. You gotta have standards. It's not the standards I have. That's the standard. For, <laughs> You stop breathing for 30 seconds for me. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a miracle. All right, all right. <clears throat> She's gonna be here tonight. It's, gonna be, it's not an accident. By the way, when she flew into town, she heard about little Olive last night and went right from the airport to the prayer meeting to pray. It's not, a, not an accident. This is the season of impossible breakthroughs. Now, I want you to surround these folks. <clears throat> surround the folks economic. Just declare over them. The God of more than enough visits your household. 
just declare that God are more than enough visit your household. That this Christmas season would be a season of great celebration, <clears throat> great breakthrough, great favor. God, give wisdom for every dollar you release. So we handle in a way that honors you. Pray this in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Thank you, God. There's a few of the folks we're praying for right now. Uh, this will make sense to a, a small handful of you. Is there's an economic issue in your life and it's been there for several generations. And uh, we're just really to break that cycle, that generational curse of lack off. If that's you, let the people that are praying for you just say, that's me. It's been multiple generations. And then those of you pray, pray with that, with that insight. We just break that cycle of generational lack. We just declare it ends now in Jesus' mighty name. All right, just de declare over them, we bless you in the name of the Lord. And now let's have everybody stand for this last one, all right? Everybody stand. How many of you have a family member who is not walking with Jesus? Just put in. It's, it's not everybody, but it's almost everybody in the room. <clears throat> so this is what we're gonna do. Just grab a hand, and if the person you are holding hands with, if you don't know their name by now, that's your fault. You've been with them for <coughs> hours here. <coughs> Excuse me. I just want you to pray for their family members to come home to Jesus. And if they have no family members, then pray for their neighbors. Just pray that this love of God will touch everybody they know. Lift your voices, let's pray. Just breakthrough. God, we just pray even for our cities, the cities that are represented here, that there would be just literally harvest of souls, of thousands, tens of thousands of people, millions through the broadcast, The people would just come to know the love of God and be restored to design, be restored to purpose. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen, amen. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast can be heard in multiple languages on our Bethel TV website. If you'd like to partner with us in discipling nations and fueling personal revival, you have the opportunity to give at Bethel.tv slash podcast slash donate.